understanding revolution and revolutionaries. So tonight we need to look at revolutions because so many people today seem entranced by the deceptive promises of communism. People seem excited about the Marx brothers, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Lenin, Stalin. It's vital that we look again at what communism really is and why so many rose up in resistance against it. The face of resistance in Romania, Christmas Revolution, 1989. Over 30 years ago, the Iron Curtain fell. From Triesk in the south to Stettin in the north, the Iron Curtain collapsed, one country after the other, and most spectacularly, the Berlin Wall, the symbol of the Cold War, collapsed. Lots of opposition. Didn't happen passively. There were people who stood up and physically smashed down the wall, which you can just see the intensity, the hatred with which people in Berlin, the separated city, families separated by communism, and the celebrations of bringing down this hated symbol of communist oppression and division. Soviet satellites broke free. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Albania, and other countries within the Soviet Union also broke free. Ukraine and Belarus and Kazakhstan and Georgia and Armenia from 15 republics came out of what had been the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And thousands, tens of thousands of statues of Lenin and Karl Marx came down. The world rejoiced. There was never a greater celebration in my lifetime than 1989, the collapse of the Iron Curtain, the Berlin Wall, and it was a new birth of freedom. 1989 was the giddy end to an incredible decade of resistance against communism. And the celebrations continued for a long time. Germany was reunited, countries throughout Europe found a new birth of freedom. Yet today, 30 years later, there's an entire generation who are apparently ignorant that they are being lied to and they're being used. I mean, who likes to be lied to and who likes to be used? They think they're advancing a noble cause, but they're actually advancing a failed and evil system. Marxism, communism. Under the delusion that they're working for a better world, a more just world, Antifa, BLM, and a whole host of others are walking, marching, rioting, demonstrating, cast aside illusions, revolution until communism. I mean, these people, the hammers and sickles, with Mao Tung, Nobel Peace Prize winner, well, should I say the Guinness Book of Records winner, of the biggest mass murder in history. 69 million people killed under him. And of course, Lenin and all the others. Do these people have any understanding what they're standing up for and promoting? The bloodstained Hammond sickle flag, 160 million people died in the 20th century alone under communism. And yet the people marching all over the world with Stalin's picture, for goodness sakes. South Africa, you've got the Hammond Sickle and Star Southern Communist Party. In fact, the African National Congress is in a National Democratic Revolutionary Alliance between Kasatu, the Southern Communist Party, and the ANC. That's what they call a tripartite alliance. If you go onto the Southern Communist Party website, you will see Southern Communist Party is not placing a candidate up for the next elections, but advise all SACP cadres to vote for the ANC candidate. They've been saying this since 1994 on their website, which means their own the ANC, or they wouldn't tell the people to vote for them. And they're not ashamed. They've got the hammer and sickle and the red flag and the five-pointed star. And <laughs> there's old Che Guevara's picture as well. This is South Africa. We've got the ANC president with his ANC banner with Southern Communist Party banners, hammers and sickles side behind. At the universities, they will have Southern Communist Party chief Jerry Jeremy Cronin, and Kasatu, and EFF, and Amandla, having an Amandla forum discussing uh, revolution ahead. In fact, in 2017, would you believe at the University of the Western Cape, what they call the University of the Working Class, uh, the EFF had a celebration 
of the 100th anniversary of what they called the Great October Socialist Revolution. Nobody in Russia was celebrating that 100th anniversary. They were more mourning. Uh, what a horrible thing to celebrate. And by the way, for those who say, well, we're just socialists, not communists. What was the Soviet Union called? The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The Bolshevik Revolution they called the Great Socialist Revolution. As Vladimir Lenin said, the goal of socialism is communism. Socialism is a pathway to communism. Socialism is just for slow learners. It's communism for slow learners. Communism is the goal of socialism. And that's why every communist state calls itself a socialist state, because they say that their goal is communism. They haven't quite reached it. Socialism is the path to communism. And so you've got the Everything for Free Party, the EFF, who uh, are marching under the idea that communism is going to give them a better world. They don't seem to understand. Mice die in mouse traps because they don't understand why the cheese is free. It's the same thing with socialism. Free this, free that, but why? Well, you put free cheese on the mouse trap to bait the. It's like putting worms on hooks for fish. There's a hook in that bait. And socialism offers free things so that they can enslave people. That's the goal. The Pied Piper is leading millions, not just of youngsters. I mean, it's one thing if people are under 30 being fooled by all this, which uh, was defeated before they were born. But there's a lot of people my age who are also following socialism for some inexplicable reason. Well, Otto Scott's book, Robespierre, Inside the French Revolution, is the very best expose of what led up to the cataclysmic event and what really took place during that disastrous revolution. Reading this extraordinary book on ropes here enables one to understand the revolutionary forces arrayed against Christian civilization today. I'm going to give a quick overview of it today because it's uncanny the similarities you can immediately recognize as to what's happening in our streets. What is happening in our streets is like the French Revolution all over again. Bolshevik Revolution too, but we'll get to that next week. And this is a playbook of the Marxists, which they've done many times before. Riots, looting, destruction. Oh, by the way, do you see the name of this? African Paradise Restaurant. It's upside down, but pretty. This is the Minneapolis Police Station, by the way. And destruction, looting. This is the result of marching. Oh, and by the way, most of the media called this protests. And the people who did all this, protesters. Well, I know what a protest is. We organized protests to Parliament. I've marched, gee, more protests than I can count. Certainly over 100 protests over the years. And we haven't broken one thing. We haven't looted one thing. We haven't left litter behind because a protest is peaceful by definition. When it's riots and there's destruction, that's no longer a protest. That's a riot. That's violence. It's the antithesis of a protest. You know, it's, it's, it's like calling, calling artillery barrages, nuclear strikes, a debate. And we can see what's going on in the media. We can see what's going on in education. And have you noticed the five pillars of the liberal faith? Hysteria, denial of reality, thought control, name calling and projection of guilt. Since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God... He gave them over to a depraved mind. We see an entertainment. Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. We see it in churches. We see it in government. Revolutionary mantras, revolutionary terminology, revolutionary concepts coming over from political speeches and even in sermons in churches. Those of us who fought against communism during the Cold War in the 80s, need to remind the younger generation of the reality. And the reality destroys the modern propaganda narrative being taught on so many university campuses and broadcast under the guise of news on the mainstream, lamestream news media. The fact is, communism is the most malicious and destructive system in the history of mankind. There has never been such an organized, satanic, antichrist system ever devised in the history of mankind to compare with communism. Nothing has murdered more people, destroyed more heritage and civilization than communism. It is the greatest evil in the history of the world. And yet, 
It masquerades under the most noble of crusades for lifting up people's standards of living, fighting for justice. They are the most abject liars ever. For hypocrites, you couldn't beat communists. The scripture says we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And this is what's happening. Those people on the streets, those people involved in a protest which inevitably become riots and looting sprees, they are being tossed about by a new fashionable fad and propaganda stunt. They're being lied to and they're being used. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, there's some people who start fires and there's others who've got to put them out. And we should be on the firefighter side, not on the arsonist side. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And that's what I plan to do tonight. That's what we plan to do every Reformation Society. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has set us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. True freedom comes from Christ. True freedom comes through regeneration. True freedom comes through repentance, not through revolution. Repentance and regeneration is a pathway to freedom, not revolution and rebellion. God's covenant people have beaten communism before, and we must defeat communism again. We must lift up the Christian flag, not the red bloodstained banner of communism. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? <clears throat> Teddy Roosevelt said to anger conservative, lie to him. To anger liberal, tell him the truth. And this is the fact. Liberals are offended by the truth. You tell them the truth and they get hysterical. But that is the difference between a person who wants the truth and who loves the truth and those who hate the truth. Thomas Paine, who lived at the time of the French Revolution, said, He who dares not offend cannot be honest. And I'm sorry to say, we've got a lot of Christians who are how to win friends and influence people, diplomatic liars, polite as anything, nice but they don't want to tell people the truth because it's going to offend them. And to be honest, we're in a society that's so intolerant of the truth that you can hardly say anything true without upsetting some of these people anyway. So it's extremely tempting to be diplomatic and lie. But that's not what we are called to do. So tonight, case study number one, the French Revolution. 14th of July, coming up very soon is celebrated in France as Bastille Day, and believe it or not, even at Franschhoek, they celebrate Bastille Day, which is insane, because um, Franschhoek was established in 1688 by French Protestants who were evicted from France under the revocation of the Edicts of Nantes under Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, and they therefore weren't involved in the French Revolution, and the French Revolution was carried out by anti-Protestants, anti-Christians. Why would a Christian community in Franschhoek celebrate Bastille Day? Well, when I've challenged them about this at the businessman's breakfast, they said, oh, just an excuse for getting drunk, which is hardly a good excuse at all. But why is France celebrating 14 July? Let me point out something. In South Africa, we just had a public holiday, 16 June. What were we celebrating? Soweto Uprising Day which as the missionaries and Christians who lived in Soweto documented in the Soweto But God book, which we've got here, Soweto But God, which we've now made available as a free ebook and uh, very well documented. The Soweto uprising of 16 June 17, uh, 1976 was nothing to be proud of. It was an evil, anti-Christian persecution church where children came and attacked their own mothers with knives burned their own homes down, burned down churches, burned down the homes of Christians, attacked ministers, attacked Christians, attacked grandmothers who were dedicated Christians. It was an anti-Christian revolution. They said it was a time of madness. They said the youth were possessed by demons. They were demon-possessed, attacking innocent people and doing massive destruction. Of course, that's not the propaganda. They killed, cooked, and ate a Catholic missionary on the streets of Soweto. That's one of the things that they're celebrating on the 16th. Of June. So make no mistake, if, God forbid, if the revolution in America succeeds, they will make a public holiday of when they started these BLM riots. And they will make an absolute mythical, legendary character out of this George Floyd. And 
you will not be able to recognize the reality from because that's what they've done with Soweto Day, Youth Day, 16 June, South Africa. That's what they've done with Bastille Day in France. That's what they've done with the Great October Revolution, which took place in November, by the way, in um, Russia. It's the lies, lies, lies. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, the lie has become the pillar of the state. The states are built on lies, literally built on a sand of lies. And Bastille Day is meant to be something noble. Biggest holiday in France, biggest celebrations, but it's a disgusting thing to commemorate. They should be ashamed of it. The French Revolution was one of the most influential events of modern history. The 10-year period from 1789 to 1799, when France went from a monarchy to a republic, to a reign of terror, to the dictatorship, was one of the most tumultuous times in European history, as was so well said by Napoleon. Anarchy inevitably leads to tyranny. That's the purpose. The chaos in the streets is designed to prepare the way for tyranny. Make no mistake, when they say we want a police-free zone, they don't want a police-free zone. They want to dismantle the present police. They want to dismantle the professional, trained police. They want to uh, remove the conservative police. And they want to replace them with BLM and Antifa thugs in uniforms. And then gun control and gun confiscations follows. This is what happened in France in 1789. This is what happened in Russia in 1917. Instead of the police of the Tsar, now you had the Cheka, and then that became the NKVD, which became the KGB. A reign of terror like the world has never before seen. I won't get into that now. We'll look at the Bolshevik Revolution next week. But Every single one of these movements works to get rid of the police, defund and dismantle the police. Not so that you have a police-free state, but that you get rid of this police and replace it with the revolutionaries' police, who will make the previous police look like saints in comparison, no matter how bad they might have been. Anarchy always leads to tyranny, and it's meant to. Much myth and romantic legend has been written on what some politicians would like the French Revolution to have been. But the reality is the French Revolution was a monstrous horror. It was a French revulsion. In the name of liberty, equality, fraternity, or morte, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, over 40,000 people lost their heads on a guillotine. Now, uh, they often censor this to liberty, equality, fraternity, but that's not the whole slogan. The slogan always was liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. Liberté, equality, fraternité, morte. That's the slogan. But I suppose it's better PR to just leave out the, the last bit. Another 300,000 people, at least, were publicly executed by firing squads, drownings, other methods of mass murder. And ultimately, many millions died in the 25 years of war and upheavals that resulted. Minimum of 6 million. The French Revolution has been the inspiration and the model for all socialist and communist revolutions in modern history. Lord Acton, in his lectures on the French Revolution, a contemporary, wrote, The appalling thing about the French Revolution is not the tumult, but the design. Through all the fire and smoke, we perceive the evidence of calculating organization. The managers remain studiously concealed and masked. But there's no doubt about the presence from the first. Anyone recognize this man to the left? Voltaire. And one to the right? Robespierre. Now, the Voltaire was like the Karl Marx of the revolution. He was the philosopher, the theory, the theoretician. He was the writer, the speaker. The Robespierre was the Lenin of the revolution. He was the one who actually put into place and murdered the people by the tens of thousands. So Voltaire, he thought it. Maximilian Robespierre, he did it. And Voltaire is famous as being the Enlightenment uh, philosopher who boasted, I have destroyed the Bible. A hundred years from now, you will have to go to a museum to see what a Bible looks like, he said. He said, uh, you there won't be a Bible left in France 100 years from now. Well, the funny thing is about 100 years after he made that post, the Geneva Bible Society bought up his home and his printing press and started to print Bibles out of his home 
<laughs> it gets even funnier because in 1913, the complete leather-bound works of Voltaire were sold at an auction for 13 cents. No, 11 cents. 11 cents in 1913. His complete leather-bound works. In the same year, one complete codex of the Bible, an ancient manuscript, was, but the full Bible, was sold for a quarter of a million pounds. 1913, same year. God has a sense of humor, but what an arrogant man this Voltaire was. However, he, he made some good comments too, because even a stop clock is right twice a day. In general, he says, the art of government consists in taking as much money as possible from one party of the citizens to give to another. And honestly, that's it. A lot of politics is just theft. And uh, theft on behalf of this group and then theft on behalf of that group and so on. How many people can identify who this picture's of? Another character. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was the philosopher who came out with the noble savage concept. He said the more primitive, the more noble. The more civilized, the more evil. In fact, to him, the idyllic life is where everyone walks around naked on some desert island uh, and just lives from fruit from the trees and coconuts and uh, eats the neighbors sometimes. Uh, he had 23 children, all of whom he consigned to the poorhouse. He never got married and he never fathered any children, never brought up any children because he said the best thing you can do with children is have them brought up by the state because it is the family that is the greatest evil in society. The family pollutes and corrupts the next generation and brings them up in Christianity. What we need is children brought up by the state in a poorhouse with atheism to destroy Christianity. We must first destroy the family. And so, and by the way, none of his children lived to adulthood. They all died in the poorhouse. All of them, all 23. And that's Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the advocate of the noble savage. And this is Maximilien Robespierre, the Lenin of the French Revolution. The tools of the French Revolution were disinformation, propaganda, the subversion of language, malice, envy, hatred, and jealousy. And by the way, the names of their newspapers were called libels. They had libel sheets. And the libel sheets, that's where the term libel comes from, the etymology of the word, uh, they would be putting in scandals and so on. And so the very concept of libel comes from the French media's um, scandal racks, sort of like what do we have today that's like that in America? I think they've got the National Enquirer, uh, whatever the equivalent is over here. And so these governments had to distract the people from what they were doing through mass murder, foreign military adventurism as a diversion to distract the masses from the failure of government. Because to get into power, a revolutionary force must promise the people extravagant things. Land, homes, jobs, peace, bread, whatever. I mean, you know, they, they just offer. Now, when they get to power, of course, they have no intention of giving the people what they've promised. So now you've got to distract them. And one of the best distractions is lots of mass murder to keep the people terrified and foreign military adventurism uh, to distract the people and conscript a whole lot off to fight and die in the war as well. Now, these tools pioneered in the French Revolution have been implemented by more modern revolutionaries, especially Vladimir Lenin, Trotsky, Joseph Stalin. We'll look at that next week. Mao Zedong in China. Fidel Castro turned a Cuban Caribbean paradise into a hellhole that people fled from by the millions across shark-infested waters. Che Guevara, this dirty, unwashed, mass-murdering drug addict criminal who adorns the t-shirts of many ignorant youngsters. Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. Nikolai Ceausescu of Romania, Pol Pot of Cambodia, Ho Chi Minh of Vietnam, Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe. Destroyed the lives of people there for 38 years. The power-mad and the disenchanted have continued to sing the praise of the French Revolution and to attempt to replicate its ideals and revolutions as far afield as Russia, China, Cuba, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Angola, the Congo and Zimbabwe. Demonic forces and enlightenment ideas of humanist philosophers such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Voltaire prepared the ground for revolution. I was astounded that brought up in Rhodesia, in my high school textbook, was 
basically singing the praises chapter on the French Revolution like it was a good thing. And, you know, we were a country that was meant to be conservative, and yet our textbook in the school was singing the praise of something which was the inspiration of the very terrorists that we were organizing to fight against. This kind of disconnect. South Africa, the old National Party Apartheid South Africa in 1989, put out poster champs celebrating the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. And I wrote letters to newspapers and Ministry of Post, Post and Telecommunications on protest and this, said, this is a disgusting thing to celebrate. It's got nothing good in it. Why would we in South Africa celebrate the very inspiration of the Marxist terrorists to murdering our people right now? We've been conscripted to go and fight them up in Angola, and you're celebrating them on a poster stamps here in South Africa. Disgusting. And this is the problem. Marxists have two ways of taking over a country. There's the violent way and there's the nonviolent way. And to be honest, the nonviolent subversion is more dangerous than the violent subversion. And so what they're doing through the media and through the textbooks and the schools is far more insidious. Let's face it, the communists don't get many countries through violent revolution. Almost all the countries they gain, they gain from internal subversion. And so actually the textbooks are far more dangerous than the terrorists. Historian Otto Scott observed French intellectuals, middle and upper class, had grown ashamed of the country, the history, and the institutions. And this happened, I saw, in South Africa, the most guilt-manipulated country ever. How South Africans were made to feel that they were bad and they were evil. Now, I would have believed this, except that I was traveling widely. I've traveled to 42 countries and worked in 38 countries. And so I'd come back and think, what do you mean South Africa is a country you're ashamed of? This is the best country, not just in Africa. It's better than any country in Europe. South Africa, the old South Africa, was one of the only countries in the world that banned blasphemous pornography like The Last Temptation of Christ, which had the Bible in schools, which had Bible reading and hymn singing in schools, where they edited out the blasphemy, the pornography, the swearing, or the gratuitous nudity, violence, and all sorts of things out of films. So that we could see a film like... Uh, take, for example, Dirty Harry without hearing a single swear word. And uh, uh, we could see any kind of uh, films here without any of the bad things. South Africa had a Publications Control Board and Publication Control Act that had a Christian base to it. In fact, it was Conor Mulder who, who um, put in the Publication Control Act and he stood in Parliament, put the Bible down, put his hand and said, this is the stand of right and wrong and this will be the stand for the Publications Control Board. The Transvaal Education Department had in its curriculum, this curriculum is designed to bring every student to personal knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The first thing I heard in the army was denominational groupings as they divide us into denominations because church attendance was compulsory in the army. The amount of things that were going on in the old South Africa that were so good, and yet South Africans were made to feel ashamed. They thought that every poor person in this country was the fault of the country. But I knew people were much poorer in every other country around us. And they were pouring into our country by the millions. From Mozambique, Angola, walking from Malawi and the Congo to come to South Africa under apartheid because they knew that apartheid South Africa was freer, with a higher standard of living, than their liberated countries. And so despite all... and. It's not like I couldn't tell you a lot of things that were wrong in the old South Africa. I preached against a lot that was wrong in the old South Africa. I saw things that were wrong, such as the hypocrisy of those who couldn't get abortions in South Africa because abortion was illegal here, but they put their children on a plane to fly to London to get an abortion in London, or went to Zimbabwe to get an abortion, or went to Baputatswana or Transkei to get an abortion. We weren't allowed gambling in South Africa, but Transvaal cars were lined up in a traffic jam every Friday night to get to Sun City or Sin City in Baputatswana to do uh, gambling there, which you couldn't do in South Africa. I, I could tell you what was wrong in the old South Africa. I wasn't blind, but even at our worst, we were infinitely light years better than our critics and what we've become. And so I wasn't guilt manipulated because I traveled and I could compare. But a person who lived in South Africa and only received what 
you got from the school textbooks and from the teachers and universities and from the newspapers and the TV and so on. It was, oh, we're so bad, we're bad, we're the worst, we're absolutely terrible. And of course, that's psychological warfare, which is what we've been dealing with in previous ones. And this is what the French were subject to. The first people in the history of the world to be ashamed of their country and their heritage and their culture. Such a phenomenon, Otto Scott wrote, had never before arisen any nation or race before throughout the long history of mankind. A great loosening became. The country slowly came apart because what is the cohesion that holds the country together? It's history, it's heritage, it's culture, it's faith, it's heroes. And when everything was just being torn down and broken down by their media, the people came to be ashamed of who they were. And so nothing was worth defending or fighting for because they believed that they didn't deserve to survive or exist or be defended. For the first time since the decadent days of Rome, pornography emerged from the caves and circulated openly in a civilized nation. First time in history. The Catholic Church in France was intellectually gutted. The priests lost their faith along with their congregations, inevitably. Strange cults appeared. Sex rituals, black magic, Satanism. Perversion became not only acceptable, perversion became fashionable, popular. Just think how in the old South Africa, who's this weird transvestite character? Dirk Ace, is it? no, who is it? Peter Dirk, Peter Dirk Ace. He takes a, a great name in history and perverts it. And here's this one who's always pretending to, to be a woman and uh, some kind of transgender character and so on. And so uh, he, he made it a joke. And it, and, but perversion isn't a joke. But it became tolerated in old South Africa because it was put over in a sense of humor. But make no mistake, it was there to undercut the traditional roles. Homosexuals held public balls to which heterosexuals were invited and the police guarded their carriages. You see, when a society tolerates pornography and perversion, it's the terminal stage of that civilization. That's when they're about to break. It's attacking the family, which is the basic building block of society. The air grew thick with plans to restructure and reconstruct all traditional French society and institutions. Now, all this is a quote from Otto Scott's book, Robespierre, Inside the French Revolution, which I read in a matter of about two or three days. It was just so gripping. And I, as I was reading, I was thinking, I've seen this before. I've seen this in South Africa. This is what's happening in our country. The heirs of the Enlightenment of the Late 18th century launched the first revolution in all of history against the ideas of Christianity and Christianity's God. And of course, Voltaire was in the front of this attack and Jean-Jacques Rousseau was just behind him. The press was spearhead, font and fuel for the revolution. The journals were mixtures of smuts and politics. And I could say that of the South African newspapers back in the 1980s as well. They were pushing the envelope. They would get banned all the time. But boy, would they just keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And normally, you'd get our worst magazine, South Africa Scope, would come out on a Friday uh, late afternoon, early evening, because Publication Control Board only met on Monday, and they'd sell a whole lot of the weekend, and Monday it would get banned. You know, that sort of thing. And you just think, you know these guys are scum. Arrest them all. <laughs> Close down the whole thing. But who was running... Scope magazine, Republican press. And who was in charge of the board? A Dumini. A theologically trained Dumini was the chairman of the board of Republican press, the biggest producer of pornography in the country. Owners of CNA, owners of Republican news agency, the biggest distributors of pornography in this country. And it was totally illegal. And virtually every single thing that they produced in Scope was banned. And then the publication's appeal board would unban it a few days later, and this you could just see there was so much subversion going on. The terrorists on the border were never a threat. The media and the university lecturers in our country, they were the real threat. They were the ones who were rotting the soul of our country. So what Robespierre, the book, I mean, is documenting about France before the French Revolution, I could just see the connection. The media admired agitators extravagantly and never discussed the church without mention of scandal nor the government without criticism. They relied heavily on tales of sin in high places and high-handed outrages of the court. No name, however highly placed and illustrious, escaped. 
I remember this too, the, the, the nonsense that would come out with. And it would be disproved uh, the next week. But, for example, remember at one stage, the front page of the Cape Times, what I call the Cape Crimes, what was the main uh, article? Oh, Jan van Riebeck, who was, by the way, on all of our One Rand coins and Father of the Nation and so on, uh, was actually uh, suspected of, of um, embezzlement, and that's why they sent him to Cape Town as a punishment. Now, you know, the founder of Cape Town, that he is in disgrace. Well, that didn't make sense, and of course, other people who studied the very next week came out to point out that's not possible because it was the, this Cape Town was the most strategic naval base outstation of the Dutch East India Company. It was a place of honor and a place of, of trust. And they wouldn't have put someone who is in disgrace or suspected here. It, it just doesn't make sense. Why would he be the effectively the first commander, or which effectively like the first governor of the Cape, if they didn't trust him? Yes, he was accused by people who were jealous of how well he was doing in the Far East. But the fact that he was given this assignment was a very high honor of someone highly trusted. And it turned out that with investigation, the East India Company cleared him of the accusations later. But that didn't matter. The point was, front page had to have a scandal, an attack against any and everything important in our country's history. Anyone, Paul Kruger, whatever, didn't matter. They'd attacked them all. Of course, in the small print on page 16, a few days later, it points out that actually that was proved wrong, but, but it doesn't matter. The front page had the scandal and the retraction came on page 16 later. This, this is the way it works. That's the way France works. Through its journals and pamphlets, it could distort, color, plead, argue, lie, report, and misreport on information upon which the balance of the realm, the kingdom, depended. The most outrageous example of this media propaganda campaign was a malicious targeting of Queen Mary Antoinette. Now, many people know of Mary Antoinette only in the most shallow, superficial, and scandalous way that don't understand what a courageous woman she was. Although the princess was initially very popular, there were elder members of the court who deeply resented having an Austrian as heir to the throne, and they made her the target of outrageous smears, gossip, and slander. This was nationalism at its most ugly. Mary Antoinette was generous with the friends and with the poor alike. The princess became major patron of the arts and sponsored soup kitchens for the poor, innovated education for orphans, even adopted some of the unfortunates and provided for them the best education possible. Despite all this, her enemies circulate rumors that Mary Antoinette was extravagant, immoral, plastered her wall with gold and diamonds. The real reason for France's increasing financial woes was actually the enormous debt which France had occurred during the Seven Years' War, and later the expense of assisting the North American colonies in the war against France's traditional rival and enemy, Great Britain. Despite her enemies depicting her as frivolous and heartless, she had many meaningful friendships. She is an avid reader of historic novels. She studied English. She certainly never said the quote attributed to her, if they have no bread, let them eat cake, which is such a classic. But she never said it. It was no serious historian accepts it. All serious historians dismissed that as revolutionary propaganda, which was attributed to the Queen because being an Austrian by nationality, she made a convenient target of hate for the revolutionaries. They had to channel the hate, not just the two-minute hate, but the hate week, as in George Orwell's 1984. The French involvement in the American War of Independence against Great Britain created an enormous debt for France. I mean, France really went into massive debt to ensure that Britain lost the American colonies because... Britain, after all, had taken away Canada from France, so this was tit for tat, this was revenge. This debt added to the financial crisis which had started with France's involvement in the earlier ruinous Seven Years' War against Great Britain and Prussia, which they lost. The colossal debt added to the financial crisis which propelled the French state into bankruptcy. Now, let me just remind you, at this moment, at the time of the French Revolution, France was the superpower of the world. It was the greatest power in the world. It had the largest population, 28 million. It had the greatest army, the greatest navy. It was the greatest economic force in the world. Uh, France was, was really the greatest power on earth at that time. Of course, it was weaker than it had been uh, a century before when it kicked all the Protestants out because they kicked out 20% of their best people, some of the most uh, established uh, tradesmen, craftsmen, some of the most noble people of the realm. Of course, their loss was 
Prussia's, Britain's, uh, Netherlands, America's, and even South Africa's gain. Uh, so France lost a lot by expelling the Protestants, 1685. But now, 1789, France is still up there at, as the greatest power in the world, economically, politically, militarily, and so on. But now they're about to commit suicide. King Louis XVI began his reign wisely. Some films depict him as a complete idiot. Well, he wasn't as clever as his wife, but he wasn't an idiot. He, was, he had some good ideas. He dismissed the large number of corrupt, incompetent ministers inherited from the court of his father, Louis XV, who was corrupt. He appointed an excellent economist, Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, as Controller General, Treasurer. Turgot proposed a drastic solution to France's economic crisis, cancellation of tax privileges for the nobles, abolition of industrial monopolies, removal of restrictions on free enterprise and other bold practical solutions. Effectively, would have been like free enterprise such as the United States of America was practicing at that time. However, the nobles pressured Louis XVI to dismiss Togo, who was the best controller general they'd ever had. The young banker Jacques Necker was then given a the task of managing the unmanageable bankrupt economy. He bravely tried some short-term measures to stave off the inevitable economic collapse, but he is working against the forces of gravity, effectively. When a country is that much in debt, they're in trouble. But when he attempted to move towards adopting to go's free market strategies, the privileged nobles and wealthy middle class forced the king to dismiss him too. And this was the real... It's not that Louis XVI was wicked. It was that Louis XVI was weak. He gave in to pressure. This was 1781. Louis entrusts one hapless man after another with a financial crisis, but to no avail. This is super important. Every single revolution in history has been preceded by bankruptcy. And you've got to understand the economic policies of people such as Obama in America, Barack Hussein Obama, as to overload the system and bankrupt the system to create an economic collapse. And personally, I think that's also um, our present Cyril the Squirrel's a uh, whole goal because his uh, policies have taken our country into a nosedive economically. Since Ramposa became president, as some Christians said two and a half years ago, our prayers are answered, our country saved, at last a president to be proud of. Since then, our economy has been in decline, negative growth rate, solidly, the whole time. It's not COVID-19 crisis, it's a lockdown crisis, but our country was in crisis beforehand with this expropriation without compensation speech, which chased away more investors and chased away more job creators. And so what is the goal? Are they just stupid? Or is this a deliberate policy to bankrupt the country, to create social unrest, to make conditions ready for revolution? And I am convinced that these Marxists are not foolish in the sense of, well, they're foolish in the sense that the fool has said in his heart there's no God, but they are working according to a strategy which makes sense to them, which is just as anarchy, leads to tyranny, so economic collapse leads to anarchy. So you need an economic collapse to lead to anarchy, and the anarchy can lead to tyranny, which is what they want, second phase of the revolution. And many of the policies that are enacted in countries today are deliberately designed to break down the economy, to break down the middle class, to break down prosperity and productivity, so that there will be more desperate people who feel I've got nothing to lose who are willing to be cannon fodder for the revolution. France's international credit rating plummeted. Does this sound familiar to anyone? The country was no longer able to secure loans. By mid-1788, the government had become paralyzed and no longer able to avoid admitting bankruptcy. When your currency is devalued, it's serious bad. Because bear in mind, this is France. This is the superpower of the world. This is the greatest country on earth. Paris is the greatest capital on earth. France is the example that people look to. And they aren't able to mention, this is akin to America economically collapsing today. The king was forced to reinstate Necker a bit too late and call for the Estates General to be convened in May 1789. The Estates General had not met in ages, something like 89 years. Uh, it was effectively the French equivalent of Parliament, but didn't have the same powers as the English Parliament. The Estates General consisted of three houses. The first estate was the clergy. The second estate were the nobility, the aristocracy, third estate to the merchants and the common people. And by the way, have you heard people speak about the fourth estate? Who's the fourth estate? 
people often talk about it now, the fourth estate's the press. In fact, in America, you'll hear it the most because the fourth estate, the press, are the ones that actually choose the government. To quote from the head of Movie Guide, Ted Bear, the media creates the culture and the culture chooses the president. So basically, uh, what do you know about any of the political candidates in our country anywhere else? I mean, virtually none of us have any personal direct knowledge of any of them. Everything we know is what the media tells us. So the media creates the culture and the culture chooses the president. So basically the fourth estate or the media, the news media, now are able to choose who becomes president. Have you noticed it's not just in America where you suddenly get all these actors? And what's an actor? I mean, in many cases, they're professional liars. Uh, they, they're the ones telling you, you must support this or you mustn't support this or we hate Trump. Why? Well, who cares what they think? They don't even know who they are. They, they have identity crisis the whole time because they, they're continually pretending to be different people. And you don't know who's the real person. In fact, many of the actors don't know who the real person is either because they're often just the last character they were in the last movie or, or stage play. And so to suddenly have a situation where the actors are telling you what to vote. I remember that in South Africa, 1992, referendum 1992, uh, which was basically de Klerk wanting a blank check for whatever he is planning to decide with ANC. Agree ahead of time. We're not going to tell you what you're agreeing to, just agree. Give us a blank check ahead of time. Of course, I and a whole lot of others said no. It doesn't matter what the question is, the answer is no. Uh, but most South Africans voted yes. Why? Because we had Springbok athletes and actors from TV programs and so on coming on TV in this country telling you what you had to You must vote yes so that we will be able to travel to other countries, we'll be able to get to the Olympics in Barcelona, that we'll be able to play rugby with the Australians and cricket with the British and all that. And this was the motivation. And a lot of people, oh, well, if he says it. But who are these authorities? They're actors and sportsmen. How on earth are they authorities on political affairs? And unfortunately, that's the problem. We're talking about the three estates, but the fourth estate is the media, news media in particular. And today, Hollywood's part of the fourth estate too. Although the third house had twice as many people as the other houses, each house was historically understood to have one vote. So the nobility get a vote, the merchants and common people get a vote, and the clergy gets a vote. And that's how they decided things, historically. Not like Britain. But Louis XVI government failed to specify how these three houses of the state general were to function, nor did he provide them with any agenda, nor even a constitution limiting the authority. Politicians always need a constitution to tie them down with the chains of constitution to prevent them from exceeding their power, to quote from Thomas Jefferson. The commoners in the third house boldly organized themselves in a self-contained national assembly. There was no constitutional precedent for this, though. The nobles were outraged and convinced Louis XVI to send troops to blockade the hall where the assembly planned to meet. The third estate then met in a nearby tennis court and vowed to continue in session until it could complete a new constitution. Now, this is outright rebellion against the authority of the king. Yet, on the 27th of June, 1789, Louis ordered the other two estates to join the commoners in the new combined assembly to go to, into their assigned place and to go according to their rules. This is not just weakness, this is foolishness. The National Assembly spent most of its time debating the latest philosophical and political theories, especially from Rousseau and from um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and from Voltaire. The Marquis de Lafayette, who had achieved his fame through his involvement in the American War of Independence, and by the way, he started out as an 18-year-old and he was still fighting there when he was 21, 22, so Lafayette was a very young general in the uh, French uh, contingent helping the Americans in the War of Independence against the British. Well, he came back from America with a whole lot of cause of freedom, and he rallied the lib liberal wing of nobles around him. Now, Lafayette had some nice ideas he picked up from America, but he's missing the key ingredient. Because the key ingredient was North America at that stage was almost totally Protestant. France was almost totally Catholic. Catholics are, follow the leader, shut up, open your mouth, take the wafer, next, um, you know, uh, kneel, confess, uh, recite this in Latin. You may not understand Latin, doesn't matter. God only wants you to pray in Latin. And uh, uh, so... The Catholic system is top down. The Pope tells everyone else what to do. Just shut up. Don't think. You're not meant to have the Bible yourself. Uh, just listen. And what are the Protestants? 
think for yourself. My conscience kept the word of God. And the Protestants are decentralized and Protestants are taught to question everything. So the freedoms that survived and flourished in North America in a Protestant majority country, could they be transplanted to France, which is a majority Catholic country, almost entirely Catholic country, where Protestants didn't even have any freedoms? So unfortunately, Marquet de Lafayette did not seem to appreciate the deep significance of the religious worldview base, that what worked in North America would not necessarily work in France, not while I had the same worldview um, that they'd had so far. Now, the Count of Mirabeau dominated the assembly through his eloquent campaign for a constitutional monarchy. He wanted a monarchy, but he wanted a constitution to restrain him, which would be modeled on Great Britain, which had a constitutional monarchy, and that seemed to work quite well. The most fanatical extremist gravitated to Maximilian Robespierre, the man on the right over here. He was a strong devotee of the writings of radical philosophers Voltaire in the middle and Jean-Jacques Rousseau on the far left. Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote, It is necessary to have a cohesive force to organize and coordinate the movements of society's members. Now this is weird because on one side he's saying you should be a naked savage able to walk around uh, on the beach and have as many relationships as you like and abandon your children and eat your neighbors if you feel like. And yet now he's talking about the need to have some coordinating cohesive force. Rousseau advocated constant agitation for equality in order to maintain atmosphere of fear where individual differences would not be tolerated. This is the most important. In the name of equality, nobody is allowed to disagree. I mean, the, so this is, they're talking freedom, liberté, fraternité, brotherhood, uh, but equality, egalitarianism. But in practice, this means you're not allowed to deviate. This is the politically correct. And if you're politically incorrect, you're going to lose your head. Simply, his main slogan was always do away with the family. The family is the root of all evil. Destroy the family, the nuclear family, the Christian family. This business of male, female, marriage, family, bring up children, got to go. Family is the first target of the revolution. You've got to destroy the family. Now, inspired by defiance of the assembly and stirred up by the revolutionary pamphlets and speeches, mobs began to roam the streets of Paris attacking and murdering royal officials to create a sense of unrest and fear. France's financial house of cards collapsed. Capital fled the country. Anyone with any money got it outside the country because it's not. they realized this could get confiscated. Economic depression resulted. A series of events combined to create food shortages and hunger. Well, you can imagine. If people can't pay their bills, if transportation is undermined, if people are afraid to travel because of attacks on the countryside and on the roads, well, suddenly there's not enough food. And so this also un makes you understand why in one year in South Africa we had 1,400 Pentechnicans, 18-wheel uh, trucks delivering food, attacked, looted, and burned. You attack the lifelines of many communities' food, you're going to interrupt food supply. You murder the farmers, interrupt the food supply. What's the goal? Starvation. Agitators panned out across the country to destroy the grain stores and terrorize inhabitants. Now, you need to understand, France had 28 million population. Robespierre and Rousseau and Danton and Marat and the others were saying, we got 20 million too many people. We need to bring the population down from 28 million to 8 million. We can't manage a country this big. We're going to have to kill 20 million people. And this is straightforward. They were just talking like that. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's people up there in the elites, such as Bill Gates, talking about, we need to bring the world's population from 7 billion down to 1 billion. In fact, ideally, we should bring it down to 100 million worldwide. Now, how are you going to bring the world population from 7 billion down to 100 million? Well, there's several billion people have to go. They've just got to die. Now, they've discussed how to do this pandemics, wars, that's okay, but that's not enough. The best way to get rid of a lot of people quickly is starvation. There's never a better way to get rid of millions of people in starvation. After all, that's how Stalin got rid of 7 million Ukrainians, just a matter of uh, one and a half years, through the decolocization, the uh, combined farms, the farm confiscations in Russia and so on. When, when you go for, for farm, what they call land reform, <coughs> That'll create 
starvation, many people say, but they can't do this. I mean, Cyril would never go for expropriation without compensation, which would lead to starvation. But that's the whole idea. That is the idea. If you understand the revolutions, the revolutionaries want starvation. They want the people to starve. So someone looking at this logically and thinking, no, but no sane person would ever <laughs> but understand communism is fire in the minds of men. It's a time of madness. It's, it's, it's an insanity that even an intelligent person can come to think, but this is good and necessary because it's for the greater good. And so there's a lot of the revolutionaries in the streets who can do incredibly evil things with a good conscience because they're convinced that what they're doing is for the good, the greater good of society, to create this wonderful liberty, equality, fraternity uh, society. And so imagine people in a time of famine going out and destroying food stores. They did that. Hired mobs staged spontaneous riots in Paris. People were paid to riot. Sound familiar? The powers of government collapsed. Everything fell apart with astonishing coordination. In reaction, some of the nobles persuaded the king to seek to reassert some royal authority. And so soldiers were ordered to the streets of Paris as a show of strength. Unfortunately, this falls into the Hegelian dialectic. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Action, reaction, and then you get a counter-reaction. Uh, this is the Hegelian dialectic. What the Marxists uh, say is, is absolutely vital. They have a revolution. You organize a counter-revolution. They wanted that. So that that will then lead to something else. It's, it's like the hammer comes down. You pull the hammer back and you bring the hammer down. That's part of the same movement. You've got to pull it back in order to bring it down. They need a reaction to justify what they are planning. So, for example, they organize atrocities to incite counter-reaction. For example, uh, you know uh, uh, Manning Johnson wrote the book Color, Communism, Common Sense, uh, which our good friend Stevie Croft brought to us and told us about. The Communist Party USA has on their books the plans. We need black mobs to go into white suburbs and shoot kids playing on the streets for no other reason than to, to, to incite white reaction revenge to go and do some atrocities in black neighborhoods. We need that because we want to create race riots. And the Communist Party in the USA, this Manning Johnson was a member of the Communist Party in, in America, and he really believed in their cause for a while, but saw that already back in 1920s, the Communist Party of the USA saw that the best way of bringing revolution to America was to bring in a racial clash. And they said, oh, yeah, this is just perfect. If we can get the black Americans to feel that they are oppressed and exploited and they will be the most uh, responsive to our um, revolutionary ideas. And so it is. The, it doesn't matter whether they're trying to get the women against the men or the young against the old or the employees against the employers, uh, whether it's class warfare, race warfare, gender warfare, doesn't matter. Whatever will create conflict, this is the goal. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, create conflict. And so the people even advised the king to send the soldiers into Paris at this time uh, for a show of strength probably realized what this would do. The appearance of the soldiers inspired mobs to seize whatever weapons they could find and to storm the old fortress of the Bastille. Now, Bastille was not even important. Bastille was an out-of-date, uh, obsolete medieval fortress that would not stand against cannon fire. It was fine for people are throwing spears and using bows and arrows, but it would not survive in an age, oh, it was far too top-heavy for an age of, of artillery. But uh, it was a symbol. And so the French Revolution is officially dated from this point, 14 July 1789. This is the big holiday in France to this day. The Bastille had become a symbol of hated tyranny because it symbolized the government, and a lot of legend grew out of this event. One of the legends is there were all these political prisoners up there that the storming of the Bastille freed. Actually, there was not one single political prisoner in all the Bastille at that time. But there were thousands of muskets and swords and tons of gunpowder, very important arsenal of weapons up there. Despite the fact that the lieutenant governor of the Bastille, Monsieur de Launay, was guaranteed safe conduct and surrendered the fortress under a white flag of truce, after assurance that all his men would go free and unharmed, the mob massacred his soldiers and the governor, cut off their heads and carried them on spikes throughout the streets. 
exactly like Soweto Uprising of 16 June 1976. This is what they're celebrating, cannibalism, effectively. As body parts of the defenders of the Bastille were paraded through the streets, a mere seven common criminals were found in the Bastille. No political prisoners in the Bastille at all. When news of the storming of the Bastille reached the Palace of Versailles, King Louis was astonished that this is revolt. And the uh, Duc de Rocher, Leon Court, responded, no, sire, it is a revolution. And that's a famous quote, too. Now, this was not a revolt. This was a revolution. And the next day, King Louis, no coward King Louis, he was brave. He arrived simply dressed with no bodyguards or tents and spoke at the National Assembly. He wanted to defuse the situation. And he did. He ordered the troops to leave Paris. The people would have no reason to fear their king. He assured them he had confidence in assembly and deputies rose to feet cheering with great fervor. Now, it looks like he's being wise here, but you see, he's gone from overreaction, like close down uh, the National Assembly to them, and then ordering his people to go and join. Uh, order the soldiers into the streets of a show of force, and then withdrawing all the troops. So he's, uh, he's being advised by, by people who can't have his best interests at stake, because if he'd be consistent one way or the other, it would help. But this inconsistency, this is similar to what Nicholas II of Russia did before the Bolshevik Revolution. It's not wicked kings that get overthrown. It's weak and inconsistent leaders. And that's what, re what really enables revolutions. There's nothing revolutionaries despise more than weakness. There's nothing they respect more than strength. And so uh, at the moment, they're all happy with him. Of course, they're happy with him because he's giving in. 88 of the deputies gathered at the Paris City Hall, took turns speaking to the enormous crowd from the balcony. And the king started wearing uh, the hats of the revolutionaries with their three-colored, tricolor uh, in his hat. The famous now 32-year-old Lafayette was elected general of the National Guard. He was a well-meaning person, but he was, this is way past his level of understanding and intelligence. He was being used by the revolutionaries now. While many seemed optimistic for the future, Mary Antoinette was filled with foreboding and burned her private papers. Nobles start to flee the court and the country, and many settled across the border, foreseeing what was coming. On the 17th of July, now remember, Bastille was stormed on the 14th of July, this is just three days later, the king travelled to Paris to identify the revolutionary mob wearing their tree colour. In October, a mob marched to Versailles, which is a few kilometres out of town, to demand that the king transfer his residence to Paris. This is actually a violent mob. Many of these women had beards. Uh, which was obviously a bunch of men in dresses too, and they attacked and they killed some of the bodyguards of the king and servants of the king. It, it was a riot, not a peaceful march. But you mustn't let facts get in the way of the legends and the stories. And they forced the king to move his family into Paris where they could control him. Otto Scott observed Paris, like the nation, was divided into politically active and the passive. Between the many confused, disorganized, abstracted, and the highly concentrated, organized, intent few, all revolutions are performed by small little elites. As has been said, both the Christian church and the communist revolution began with a handful of disciples in the upper room. And that's true. It's just a few people who do either good or evil. The bulk of people are sheeple who don't even know what's going on or just follow whoever's the leader at the time. The bulk of people are not actually aware of what's going on. As I say, 5% make things happen, 15% watch things happen, 80% have no clue what happened. Two clubs came to dominate the assembly at this time. The Cordeliers, led by Georges Jean Danton and Jean-Paul Marat, and the most radical of all, the Jacobins, was skillfully manipulated by Robespierre. Now, Jacobin continues to be... a uh, term of derision, if you've read any Charles Dickens or Jane Austen, a Jacobin was the worst thing you could accuse someone of being, because that's like calling a person a communist revolutionary. Uh, Jacobins were the first communists, in fact, to even read Engels and Marx, they, they recognized Jacobins, they were the communists, vanguard of the revolution. It was in the French Revolution that the terms left-wing and right-wing were first coined. Those on the left were the radicals who proudly adopted the designation we are the left as a symbol of the revolutionary defiance of Christian tradition because in the Bible, the left has always symbolized the damned. The right has symbolized those on God's 
right hand. So God says on the day of judgment to his sheep on his right, come, ye beloved, to the house of your father, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. And to those goats on his left, he says, depart from me, cursed in the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The left are the damned. They said, we are the goats. We're the enemies of God. We are the left. And so the very term left wing came out of revolutionary France. And this I read in James Billington's Fire in the Minds of Men, Origin of the Revolutionary Faith, that the term left wing. And so what do we say of Christians who call themselves left wing Christians? Do they understand the etymology of this word? Uh, the Bible says the fool's heart is on his left side. And there's a lot in the Bible where left is always bad and right is always good. I mean, that's just pretty consistent throughout the scriptures. On the 4th of August, 1789, the nobles and clergy renounced their privileges in the name of revolutionary equality. Just think of these people right now who are falling all over themselves in America to renounce their race, nation, gender, culture, position, uh, kiss feet, wash feet, uh, apologize for who they are. On the 2nd of November, the assembly vote to issue new paper money called Asenats, which became worthless. Paper money always becomes worthless. Sparked of rampant inflation. On the 2nd of November, the assembly voted to confiscate all church property. And this uh, was led by running around with priests' heads on pikes and so on. Very violent, very vicious, hijacking of the church. July 1790, the assembly nationalized the Roman Catholic Church by enacting the civil constitution of the clergy. You may say, what about the Protestant churches? Remember, they were illegal. They'd been evicted. They'd fled. Huguenots, as far as Cape Town. So, uh, By the way, this also is behind the scenes of the film The Patriot, which Mel Gibson is part of. Uh, the character... The Marsh Fox, which the ghost is, is based on, was actually a French Huguenot of French Huguenot grandparents who had come to America to get away from the massacres of the Huguenots in France, which explains why he was so anti-French. But because uh, Mel Gibson is a Roman Catholic, he left that out, wanted that on the cutting floor that didn't enter into the film, even though that's part, historically part of the character which is why he doesn't like the French, but you don't actually get to know why he doesn't like the French. Because, in fact, the March Fox was French, of French extraction, French heredity. He hated them because they had evicted and murdered his Protestant uh, ancestors. Uh, but you don't get that in a modern patriot film, even though that was part of the original script and the history of the actual characters it was based on, because that would have brought up a negative view towards the Roman Catholics. Now, this picture tells you quite a lot. There you can see the, uh, a church burning, the guillotine here, and there's a revolutionary sitting on a lamppost with uh, a bishop and a priest uh, hung from the lamppost. And uh, you can see the revolutionary cap there. You see the, the cross in the wall. So he's on a church where they've hung the priest and they're burning that church and the guillotine people, and there's the French revolutionary flag. That is... A picture symbolizing the revolution and the contempt for Christianity in particular. The assembly undertook to pay the salaries of the priests from the national treasury. Why? To control them. And to create a French church under control of the government. To this day, Notre Dame in France belongs to the French government. Even though the Roman Catholic Church is allowed to use it, the church belongs to the state, which means the state has to pay for repairing the burnt church because uh, the church was taken away by the revolutionaries. Napoleon gave it back to the church, but after Napoleon's time, uh, the church was still understood to be in the ownership of the French state, as it is to this day, even though the Catholic church is allowed to use it. So the church built it, the state seized it, but now they allow the church to use it again. It's, it just explains the mess that France is in to this day because of the revolution. Pope Pius VI quite rightly excommunicated all clergymen who took the new oath demanded by the assembly because effectively they were denying Christianity and they were becoming atheistic revolutionaries. So how could, um, quite right, no church uh, could tolerate that. Most of the clergy refused to take the oath and therefore were evicted from their pulpits and their parishes. So they lost not only jobs, but their homes. France was divided into 83 departments, what we'd call counties. And now look at this. Does this not remind you of something, this 
few tablets. Doesn't it remind you of Moses giving the law? Well, National Assembly now produced the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizens. And again, I was taught at school, this was a wonderful, tremendous, outstanding thing. The first Bill of Rights, which is a lie. The English Bill of Rights of 1689 long predates us, and Magna Carta long predates that, and the Dooms of King Alfred long predates that, and what about the Ten Commands in the Bible? But uh, we were taught in our school textbooks, which are printed in Britain, that the Declaration of Rights of Man was a first Declaration of Rights in history, which is total garbage. This was patented after the English Bill of Rights of 1689, an American Bill of Rights, which had been appended to the U.S. Constitution, but the French Declaration embodied humanistic ideas of the Enlightenment. It might have had some of the wording of Bill of Rights as though it was like the Protestant predecessors, but this was humanist to the core. And while attempting to adopt many of the forms of biblically orientated Magna Carta, the Great Charter and the English Bill of Rights, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man failed to recognize the Creator, ignored the biblical foundations for their freedom. So what this is, is the state is giving you some rights, or actually more correctly, some privileges, which they can take away. Because rights recognized, given by Almighty God, cannot be rescinded by government. But rights offered to citizens by government could be adapted, withdrawn, suspended by the state. Right. You see the difference. A new constitution was completed in 1791 with a unicameral, that means no longer checks and balances, it's just one, it's not an upper house and lower house, it's just one chamber, elected by active citizens. What's an active citizen? Member of the party. An active citizen, it's like when I've been at a communist meeting and they've been speaking about the people shall govern. I said, well, I'm one of the people. And they said, no, you're not. What do you mean I'm not one of the people? Am I not a person? No, you're not. I'm not a person? No. What's a person? Member of the party. Which party? Communist party. Oh, so you're not a person if you're not a member of the party? No. When we're talking about the people shall govern, we're talking about the party shall govern. Oh. So, uh, what about people not member of the party? Well, you're not a person. Dead serious. Try it. I mean, when they talk about the people shall govern, they're only talking about members of their party. Before Mirabu died in April 1791, he predicted that all their well-deliberated efforts at reform would collapse and be washed away in a bloodbath. He saw the writing on the wall. Now, they provoked Louis the Sixteenth to uh, this. They obviously wanted him to flee, so they... they made life so miserable and so unpleasant in Paris that ultimately Louis XVI attempted to flee with his family from France because he could tell. They're talking about, you know, we're going to kill you, we're going to kill your children, we're going to kill your wife. So on 9th of the 20th of June, 1791, he obviously waited too long for this, but now he attempts to flee. When radicals discovered them, they blocked their path and escorted the royal family back to Paris. This is almost certainly orchestrated, planned, exactly thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and so, big parade with the revolutionary forces escorting the king and his family back, where they're now put under arrest. Danton and Robespierre seized upon the event as the opportunity to proclaim France is now a republic, because effectively the king has abdicated by attempting to flee the country. Well, after them threatening to kill him for living under terror uh, for the last two years, well, what do you expect? But this is what they were waiting for. As the new legislative assembly met on the 1st of October 1791, the Girondists proposed replacing the just adopted constitution, creating a republic. The Declaration of Rights of Man didn't even last a year. And that great constitution that they still teach about as being so significant in our, our history books didn't even last a year. I mean, the revolution himself threw it out. Deeply concerned for the fate of the royal family, Austria, ruled by Leopold II, brother of Marie Antoinette, now prepared to invade France to try and rescue her sister. The Assembly of France declared one Austrian 1792. Excellent. They've got a distraction, which they need because they're failure at home. The French were soon defeated by the Austrians and the Prussians. Not surprised. Bunch of rabble facing professional soldiers. No question. But now France starts to reorganize so that they can expand and invade their neighbors. The mob stormed the king's residence, massacred the Royal Swiss Guards, and there was Napoleon, a young lieutenant, watching this from outside, thinking... Why does the king not order his men to open fire? Why does he not turn the cans at him? I would never uh, hesitate, he said, for a moment to turn the cannons on the mob and give them a whiff of grape shot. You cannot reason with the mob, said Napoleon. And Napoleon, five years later, did just that. They stormed the palace. The king ordered his men not to resist. And the Swiss guards died to the man. 
Now, not a French soldier defended the king, but every Swiss soldier. And the Swiss weren't there to defend the king. The Swiss were the private guard of the queen. And uh, quite rightly, the Austrian royal family didn't trust the French, proven to be accurate. And the Swiss soldiers proved to be the kind of soldiers they've always been. They died to the man. Not one Swiss soldier surrendered. The assembly now voted to depose the king and write a new constitution. And of course, when you're deposing a king, you've got to pull down statues, monuments, historic monuments are a vital part because they want to replace the heroes of the past with new heroes. New gods need to be installed as well. 10th of August, 1792, the municipal government was overthrown. Danton became the self-appointed national dictator. So from a democratic constitutional monarchy to republic to a dictatorship, just like that. The entire male population is now drafted for military service. Weapons production entered high gear because the moment you've got a revolution, you've got to, exp you've got to export the revolution. It's September 1792. The interesting thing is, before they started to arrest all the nobles for being politically incorrect because they belonged to the wrong class, they released all the thugs and criminals from the prison. So all the real criminals were released, and then they turned those terrorist mobs on the prisons, which now were filled with gentlemen and ladies and seamstresses and people who mind their own business, but they were politically incorrect and had them massacred by the thousands. They stormed in many nobles who'd been arrested for no other reason than they were just the wrong class. They're politically incorrect. And this great massacre was obviously organized by Robespierre and they ran around hacking to death people. And these were people who used to be in the prisons, which are now killing the new people in the prison. Sort of like letting people out of prison because of COVID-19, uh, real criminals out and then locking up surfers and people have walked their dog and hairdressers and so on. That kind of thing. A new national convention was now called on 21st September 1792 to write a new constitution. And they summoned the deposed king, who they now called Louis Copet, as he is now called. And on 21st of January 1793, King Louis XVI was beheaded on the guillotine. A brave man, but a foolish and weak man. All of Europe was obviously horrified, and now a coalition was formed against France. Austria, England, Holland, Prussia, Spain, Piedmont, they're all prepared to restore order to France. The Jacobins now mobilized the mob to invade the convention and arrest the 31 leading Girondists, who were considered now not radical enough. Sort of shades of uh, the Mensheviks who seized power in Russia under the uh, under Kerensky, now being overthrown by the Bolsheviks of Lenin. This launched the Reign of Terror, which officially began 2nd of June, 1793. Robespierre established the Committee of Public Safety. I mean, you wonder where George Orwell got his ideas from in 1984, where you've got the Ministry of Love does the torture, the Ministry of Truth tells the lies and propaganda, Ministry of Plenty organizes the starvation and the famines and the rationing. And the Ministry of Peace organized the war. Do you know what KGB stands for? A Russian friend said to me, KGB in Russian says Ministry of Homeland Security. The greatest terror inducing secret police force in ever. They have these innocuous names. The Committee of Public Safety. For goodness sakes, what did they do? Well, they beheaded 40,000 people. A mass policy of public terror was unleashed with revolutionary tribunals in which all enemies of the revolution were summarily tried. No defense, of course, allowed. Mere accusations were tantamount to verdicts of guilt. The trials were abrupt. If you've seen the film uh, Tale of Two Cities or read the book, you know how that worked. With no real opportunity granted to the accused to prepare or to present any defense. Defense is necessary because it's not what you've done. It's who you are. You're the wrong class. You're politically incorrect. You're doomed just because of who you are. It's not a matter of what you've done, what you haven't done. The accused were quickly convicted and carted off, literally carted off. That's where the term comes from. They're put in a cart, an open cart, so that people could swear at them and throw rotten food at them and things like that while they traveled through to the guillotine. And the crowd screaming with excitement when they saw their heads displayed. The queen, 37-year-old Mary Antoinette, was now dragged to the mockery of a trial on 16 October 1793 and guillotined the very next day. She was tried by the Revolutionary Tribunal and remained composed in the face of outrageous accusations and abuse. She declared a clear conscience 
her Christian faith and her love for her children. With a, within a day, her hair was cut short and she was driven through Paris in open court wearing a simple white dress. Why? Why did they have to do that? They wanted to strip her of dignity. She couldn't wear her royal robes. She couldn't have long hair. They, Again, maybe they're inspired by the Bible saying that a long hair is a glory for a woman. And so they, just that mentality that they do that sort of thing. At 12.15 p.m. at the age of 37, Mary Antoinette was executed at the place of the revolution, today the place of the Concord. She is courageous to the very last. In fact, to show what a, what a lady she was, she accidentally stepped on the toe of the executioner, who was about to chop her head off. She said, forgive me, sir. It was an accident. I mean, she's, which is a Christian attitude that if you, if you cause an injury or you uh, do a mistake, that you apologize. And to the last, she's thinking more of, of correct etiquette. And this, this is a bloodthirsty Marxist savage who wants to behead her, and she apologized for stepping on his toe. Her son, later recognized as Louis the Seventeenth, died as a result of inhuman treatment by a revolution, his revolutionary jailers. Now, this is one of the most disgusting aspects of the revolution. They took her son away from her and, and so brainwashed and worked on him until he renounced his Christian faith, cursed his parents, and blasphemed so that they could report to Mary Antoinette before she died, which is why they took longer for her to die, to let her know that your son won't be joining you when he dies. He's not coming to heaven. We've got him to curse Christ and blaspheme, and he's going to come to hell with us. That's the mentality of the revolutionaries. That's what you're dealing with. In 1815, during the Restoration, both her body and that of Louis XVI were exhumed and received a decent Christian burial in the necropolis of the French royalty at the Basilica of St. Denis. Few women have been called on to endure such a total reversal of fortunes. Born at the very apex of power and privilege in Europe, in Vienna, her family being the Habsburgs, dying at the hands of a brutal mob during the French Revolution. And the fact that to this day most people have a frivolous and negative view of her. Shocking. Mary Antoinette was a victim of circumstance completely outside of her control and one of the most courageous people. Yet she faced her fate with Christian courage and faith. I remember at, uh, when Christopher was at an independent Christian school, um, a break in our homeschooling curriculum while my wife was fighting cancer, and he uh, was required to do an, an essay, and I think it had to be an oral too, on Mary Antoinette. And uh, uh, they all expected to be, everyone else's was anti-Mary Antoinette, and Chris was the only one who gave a positive one, of, you know, what a great heroine she was, and created quite an uproar in the school. A Christian school, which was following the propaganda line. How independent and how Christian is that? Well, 21 Garondist leaders, including Madame Roland, was also beheaded shortly after the Queen. This is the great thing about revolutions. They inevitably kill their own. Madame Roland, who was the inspiration for Madame Defarge in Tale of Two Cities, sitting there knitting while heads roll and speaking about come and sneeze into the basket and, basket and look through the window of Madame Guillotine and all these dirty, sick jokes that they had. Uh, so Madame Roland, she ended up on the guillotine herself. And the Duke of Orleans, who had joined the Jacobins and taken the name of Citizen Egalitaire, even voted for the death of his cousin, the king. He was also executed at this time. And this is the point. Revolutions are cannibalistic. They kill their own. Romantic occultism has taught a Big Bang theory of social science, social Darwinism. If you can blow up and burn down enough buildings, kill enough people, you can produce utopia. I mean, once upon a time there was nothing, and then there was something, and something became everything. The reign of terror spread throughout France, where one city sought to resist, it was destroyed. The revolutionary set up a pillar outside Lyon, inscribed, Lyon waged war with liberty. Lyon is no more. Well, what is liberty if it's so vindictive and intolerant? They've hijacked a term that doesn't belong to them. Toulon was subjugated under the leadership of a young artillery officer from Corsica, Napoleon Bonaparte. The Committee of Public Safety launched a vicious atheistic war against Christianity where people could come and divorce uh, their families under some kind of secular ceremony uh, because the other person didn't have the right political views or something like that. 
Of course, nuns and priests were guillotined if they disagreed. They invented a new religion which they called the Cult of Reason. And they actually had idols that people would bow before. At a festival at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, an actress, actually a prostitute, was enthroned as the goddess of the French people, and France was renamed the Republic of Virtue. I mean, even the terms virtue. Ancient Rome was lifted up as the model. The press and theatres were turned into instruments for state propaganda. Fashions changed to loose, immoral Roman robes. Over 2,000 churches were renamed Temples of Reason, hijacked by the promotion of this atheistic cult. Historian Arnold Toynbee wrote, In the Revolution, a sinister ancient religion suddenly re-erupted with elemental, that means primitive, violence, the fanatical worship of collective human power. The terror was only the first of the mass crimes that have been committed in this evil religion's name. On the 7th of May, Robespierre sought to impose a new religion on France, and he declared a new calendar with a 10-day work week. And day one started in 1793, uh, year one, I should say. So they attempted to start new... new um, uh, imagine if you had a 10-day week, and, uh, and this was the year... Uh, 200 and something, you know, that that's what they wanted. 21st of September, 1792, the day the monarchy ended, was declared the first day of year one. So by 1793, now they're on year, uh, they, they've got to year one of the revolutionary calendar. Robespierre now appointed himself high priest of the supreme being in this cult. So from being atheistic and anti-religion, they've now got new religion, which is doubtless Satanism. And this is what the people had to be part of. A lot of people are thinking, wait a minute, this looks a bit bizarre. We thought we were anti-religion, now we've just got another religion. And who is the supreme being that we're worshipping? It looked pretty arc and dark and occultic. Now the revolutionaries began to turn one another. Danton, who'd been their dictator, was executed on the 5th of April, 1794. Sort of like Stalin having Trotsky, the hero of the revolution, axed, literally. While taking a Dissonal bath for his debilitating skin disease, Marat was assassinated by Charlotte Corday, a Girondist sympathizer. In his death, Marat became an icon to the Jacobins as a revolutionary martyr. The angel of assassination, she is called. Charlotte de Corday declared at trial, I knew that he, Marat, was perverting France. I've killed one man to save 100,000. Courageous woman. She referred to Marat as a hoarder and a monster who is respected only in Paris. Brave woman. 17th of July, 1793, four days after she had killed Marat, 24-year-old Charlotte Corday executed by guillotine. Defiant to the end. Now that's brave and courageous. And the point is, she reckoned at this stage, I'd rather not live under this uh, disgusting regime and I'm going to be a victim somewhere along the line. Might as well go out taking one of these scum with me. 27th of July, 1794, Robespierre the Vladimir Lenin of this revolution and 20 of his henchmen were seized and executed by the survivors of the convention. The man who was the heart and soul and brain of the revolution in France, Robespierre, ended up on his own guillotine, shot in the jaw in the assembly and dragged out and they put him in the back of the cart that they'd carted the king and so on in and forced him into the guillotine that he had had so many other people killed him. More than 40,000 victims had been murdered on the guillotine under the reign of terror. 300,000 others murdered by firing squads or drowning. Over two-thirds of these victims were peasants, artisans, or workers, not even the politically incorrect wrong class. As Madame Roland was being ushered up the platform to be guillotined, she faced the statue of the goddess Liberty and cried out, O oh, Liberty, Liberty, what crimes have been committed in thy name? Well, she would know. She's the inspiration for Madame Defarge. She had voted for and chaired how many thousands of other people's deaths? This is the wheel turning. But yes, I, sell you my, what you sow, you'll reap. The end of the reign of terror was not the end of the French Revolution. It would be followed by the Directorate when Napoleon Bonaparte turned the artillery cannons on the mob in Paris and gave them a whiff of grape shot, which ended mob rule and brought some stability. As he said, anarchy inevitably leads to tyranny. And the directorship eventually culminated in Napoleon's empire, which embroiled all of Europe in a ruinous, devastating war. Even after the death of Robespierre, the revolution continued to talk about liberty and equality. 
to fight against the Christian faith and to inspire more communes, more men of virtue, more Vladimir Lenins and Joseph Stones and Fidel Castro's and Mao Tung's and Robert Mugabe's. The French Revolution was the prototype, the gold standard, which was followed by the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 and the Chinese Revolution of 1949 and the Cuban Revolution when the Caribbean paradise was turned into a communist hellhole. The Cambodian Revolution, which killed one-third of the total population in the killing fields of Cambodia. The Vietnamese Revolution, which killed millions. The Ethiopian Revolution, which not only killed Haile Selassie, the last emperor of a line of over 2,800 years of that line of emperors of, of Ethiopia. The Mozambican Revolution of, Mount, of Samora Michel, the Angolan Revolution of Agostino Neto, disciple of Castro drunken, psychotic Marxist poet, who decided to emulate his hero Voltaire by saying, I have destroyed the Bible in Angola. You will have to go to a museum in 10 years from now to see what a Bible looks like. I have destroyed the Bible. Well, 10 years later, we smuggled in more Bibles into Angola than had existed when he had made that false prophecy. And the Zimbabwean revolution of Robert Mugabe, who said, never, never, never again will Zimbabweans be colonized. Yellow, here comes China, uh, who now has got the farms and everything else like that. And liberation Zimbabwe looks something like this, being whipped and beaten by the police in the streets. And many others. Communism is the greatest evil in the history of mankind. In every case, they have proved that yesterday's revolutionaries become tomorrow's tyrants and dictators. This is China, the inspiration for the lockdown. Black Book of Communism documents in over 900 pages, all from the communist state's own archives, found after the fall of the Soviet Union, written by six communists. Stefan Cortier being editor of the Communisme magazine in France. This is not written by the Richard Vaughan Alexander Solzhenitsyns, and other anti-communists. This is written by the commies themselves, from their own archives. And they document 100 million people killed between 1917 and 1991, just in the Soviet Union's empire. And that's not even counting what Mao Zedong did in China because we don't have those archives available to us yet, which would push it into the 160 million. Professor Rommel has documented in his death by government the greatest killer in all of history has been secular humanist states in the 20th century. They've killed more people in the 20th century than all other centuries combined in the name of liberty, equality, fraternity, justice, peace, all that stuff. These are the most evil people ever to have inhabited this earth. And this Che Guevara, who banned books, banned music, hated blacks, murdered gays, has become the symbol of hope and freedom, which a whole lot of blacks, gays, musicians and so on wear. Just showing how ignorant people can be when it comes to following fashion. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. To Peter 2 verse 19 can be written of all them. 2 Chronicles 19 verse 2, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. This, needs, this warning needs to be given to every supporter of Antifa and BLM and all these other Marxist groups out there. If, if there are people in Cape Town who belong to Christian churches who support the EFF, who describe themselves the Marxist, Leninist, Communist Party. How can any Christian want to help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? In Charles Darwin's classic novel, A Tale of Two Cities, he contrasts London with Paris. In London, he shows the fruit of the great evangelical awakening of George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley. This contrast in Paris, where the Renaissance humanism of Rousseau and Voltaire led to the French Revolution and the reign of terror. Dickens' famous opening sentence summarized the drama of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times... It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. The contrast between Christianity and communism is dramatically presented throughout a tale of two cities. 
the fruit of the Protestant Reformation, the great evangelical awakening was wisdom, faith, light, hope, and joy. The fruit of the anti-God, radical, secular humanism, and the revolutionary fanaticism which had triumphed in France in 1789 produced the worst of times. An age of foolishness, unbelief, darkness, despair, and misery. So it was most appropriate that in 1989, at the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher of Great Britain presented French President Francois Mitterrand, who, by the way, was a member, leader of the Communist Party of France, a leather-bound first edition of Charles Dickens' immortal book, A Tale of Two Cities. When reporters at the G7 conference in Paris, which had been orchestrated to meet at that very time to mark this wonderful 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, they flocked to ask Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady's impressions of the French Revolution. She responded, It resulted in a lot of headless corpses and a tyrant. Margaret Thatcher had a sense of the momentous event as this G7 conference had been scheduled to coincide with the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. And the Iron Lady's symbolic act of resistance was itself historic. Margaret Thatcher advised the French president to read A Tale of Two Cities. Learn why the French Revolution was completely unnecessary, she said. Ah, you can see why we love people like Margaret Thatcher. Best man Britain ever had as a prime minister. <laughs> the French Revolution, because nothing embodies liberty, equality and fraternity like mass murder of tens of thousands of people, arbitrary legal rulings and aggressive wars of conquest against your neighbours. And this is celebrated by, for example, the Southern Post Office. This, by the way, is just one mass grave found in Paris of victims of the guillotine. Every head separated from the body. This is just one of the um, memorials to the people who were killed by the guillotine in France. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. And so we need to remind people of this. Excellent books, Tale of Two Cities. There's also an excellent film I recommend, and we've got in our library, the Ronald Coleman 1936 version. It begins with scripture, it ends with scripture. It's true to the book. A lot of the modern films have edited out the heart and soul of, of this. But this cast of thousands, massive, big epic, really well produced. And the book, Robespierre, which is in our library here, uh, absolutely if a person wants to understand revolution, this makes sense of every revolution. And also, Fred Swartz and David Noble wrote, You Can Still Trust the Communists to Be Communists. It comes from the earlier You Can Trust the Communists by Fred Swartz, which David Noble's updated. because It's got all the low-life scum on one page, basically, there on the cover. Essential reading for anyone to understand how to negotiate and deal with Marxist revolutionaries like BLM and Antifa. And let me add the EFF as well. The Agenda, Master of Deceit DVD, document, it's in a brilliant expose, how revolutionaries work, how they think, and how you can resist the unreasonable and suicidal demands. Absolutely outstanding. And then Stephen Mitford Goodson explains from an economic point of view, a history of central banking and the enslavement of mankind. Outstanding weapons. And for a, a drama... Bitter Harvest, written on the decolocization of Ukraine. This is also in our library, video library, very well put together. What I like about it, it was made by Ukrainians, and it was it specifically has resistance. It's not just a documentation of how bad they were. It's a drama which has at its heart resistance to communism. And there was a lot of resistance in Ukraine. And when you have that kind of background, you will join our Ethiopian Christian friends in chopping down idols of Lenin. Smash cultural Marxism. So, we will have this up on our frontlinemissionsa.org website uh, soon. We'll deal with these things. We've got quite a lot on our free PDF books like Soweto But God and Christian Terror. Uh, these are and a lot of other key books that help. Any questions? Any comments? Um, I wanted to comment that I once watched a cartoon, basically supposed to be for kids, about Mary Antoinette. And how she was apparently living a very luxurious life while everyone else was suffering and she loved cake so much that no one else was allowed to have cake. That's basically what they were telling children. And that um, one of the servants came to her and said, uh, Lady, no one else, like people are lacking bread. And that's when she supposedly said, 
if they don't have bread, you can cake or something like that. Yeah, that, like, that is so fictional. And it's actually slanderous. It's just not fair. Because yeah. it doesn't fit a character. But, but, it's, but that's the caricature we all were brought up with. Mm. I mean, all of us. Yeah. That's all we got. I never got the truth this until I read Robespierre by Otto Scott. And then I started to read other books about it. And it's like, she is actually a wonderful person. She does not deserve this caricature. And it's really sad that they actually also, they basically target everyone from children already. So oh, that's so clever. Yeah. It's clever, but it's, it's, it's wicked. Yes? How, how did textbook become, textbooks become so non-factual? Well, the first thing is because governments started to write them. And this goes back to 1848. Because in 1848, Marx's manifesto, he said, basically, look, these cursed Protestants have taken over education. We are going to have to get into education. And so he said, a Marxist goal must be the state must control education, train and license teachers, write the textbooks, choose the curriculum. It's a Marxist agenda because up till then, the church was leading education and the parents were running education. So... Um, they, this was done deliberately to under, it, it's, it's a tribute to how effective Christian education had been by the 19th century that the Marxists saw the need to target education particularly to undo all the damage from their perspective that Christians had been doing which is why it's so important for us to write history books and which is why Christian Liberty Books which have been going for 25 years now with 6,000 titles for home education primarily is so important to me you know, theocentric Christian education, accelerate Christian education, all the Christian curriculum provides are super important. This is the hope for the future, that, that we, we don't get our textbooks from these antichrist pagans who particularly want to mess up our minds. Yes? Well, how would you advise children in school or students to fight the lies? In, is it even possible? Oh, sure. Sure. It's def definitely possible definitely possible there's excellent books i mean just to look at some of the the children's films like so we've got for example these um uh what are they called just behind you angela we've got some of these heroes um what's the torchlighters the torchlighters films they are so good and they they'll have uh, great heroes of faith you know perpetue and uh, richard vaughan brunt and mary slesser and so on and, and i think starting with so nice character studies well presented age appropriate um, and, and, of course, we've got the books on those lines. And this is the thing, to find the good resource. I think there's excellent um, curriculum providers now. And so there's a lot of the good films that I think is appropriate even for young kids. Other questions? Um, uh, Mr. Peter, I'd like to say thank you very much um, for this evening. It's always an absolute pleasure. A lot of the times um, I get this moment of incredible gratitude in the bigger scheme of things. There's many other um, sources that most people are getting their information from, and I'm thankful that we can be here today and um, mm. learn from you um, the truth um, and get a, a glimpse of our true history. Um, and that segues into the question, um, what is, what in South Africa's history, what was the huge intervention that God brought upon that I you know, would assume is what created the great, the goodness in our country and what Marxist and communist now are seeking mm. to destroy because it was once great. Yes. And I can only imagine it was due to God's hand. So was there, a, you know, was I don't know, I don't know if Jan Rubik was Christian and if he brought. Well, you know, for example, uh, at the very beginning, the first thing done in Cape Town, uh, 1652, as Jan van Rubik landed, I've actually got his whole prayer here, but just read some of the prayer of Jan van Rubik. First thing he did, 6th of April, 1652. Oh, gracious, most merciful God and Heavenly Father, in your divine majesty, you have saved us and called us to guide the affairs of the Dutch East India Company in this place. And to this end, we are gathered here together in your name. May the discussions we take further maintain justice and among these wild and uncivilized people, may your true and perfect Christian teachings be established and spread the honor and praise of your holy name and the prosperity of our God Almighty, without whose merciful help we are powerless. Therefore, we pray to you, most merciful Father. And he prays continually here so that the Reformed faith may spread throughout from this outpost in Cape Town through this continent. And 
Uh, it's it's and he ends up with praying the Lord's prayer together with them. When you look at that, was the first act of the establishment of Cape Town, but the book that established this country was the Bible. Every four trekker wagon had a Bible, and uh, the the hallowed uh, uh, practice, which I even saw when I came down from Rhodesia, every Afrikaans family after meal would have book of fat, bring in the Bible, the father or the grandfather would open the Bible. And if they had servants, if they had people in the field, they would all come and gather around and the Bible would be read. This is always at the end of a meal. And uh, I saw that. I mean, I even saw this in the 70s and 80s coming here, up in Southwest Africa. This is a bible oriented country. And um, there's, there's a book we've got here called The New Calvinists. New Calvinists? Or Calvinists in Africa, I think, maybe. Where it said, if John Calvin came back to the world in the 1970s, this book came out in 1974, there's no country in the world you'd feel more at home than South Africa. And, you know, how South Africa takes the Sabbath the most seriously in the world. It's got the strictest laws against pornography, blasphemy, Sabbath desecration, uh, Bible in schools, Bible in the army, chaplains, periods, all this. And uh, how the laws in this country are so much in accordance with, with uh, uh, what John Calvin tried to establish in Geneva. And I think it's because right from the beginning, the people here were God-fearing, Bible reading people and every home they'd read the Bible they all knew like um, Paul I don't think he had any formal schooling uh, present of transfer uh, but he was a Bible reading man so therefore he was a very wise man and uh, you, you could see so many great things coming out of that being a Bible reading country made this country super strong and great and it was when I came to this country 1977, the TV had just been introduced. 1976, now many people getting it by 77, by 78. Well, when I first came to South Africa, I had got the gospel everywhere, right, left, center. I was brought up in a secular family, I had never heard the gospel before. And suddenly there were Christians everywhere. And the Christian union at the school was huge. And I go to a cinema on a Sunday and the church taking over for an evangelistic crusade and I get saved. And uh, to Experience South Africa in the 70s was something else. It was for a person with a totally secular background, secular family, it was wow. It's like every second person you meet in South Africa is a Christian. And uh, it, that was what it was like. And we had massive youth camps. Uh, uh, Pines High was only 280 students at that stage. And we'd have something like 120 at the Christian Union camp. Uh, just about half the school went to the Christian Union camp on the weekend, things like that. Uh, tremendous uh, influence everywhere. And I must say, uh, again, going in the army, all the, all the impact. But TV came in. Now, at first, we'd do door-to-door evangelism. We'd knock on the door in Pines, 4,500 homes in Pines, EE, doing door-to-door. And uh, everyone would invite you in, sit down, serve tea or coffee, uh, let you talk about it and so on. But within a year of arriving here and uh, being converted, so by 78, I start to see people less happy to invite you in or they let you in and just turn down the TV, not switch it off. You could see the TV was interrupting. And by 79, it was hard to do door-to-door evangelism really because the encroachment TV, the character changed. When, uh, when I was brought up, it was acceptable for you to knock on anyone's door, anywhere, anytime. Uh, for example, when I was hitchhiking, I came to some towns uh, as a soldier or as a missionary and uh, pouring with rain and no cars traveling. I'd knock on a total stranger's door. Excuse me, would you mind if I laid my sleeping bag out on your veranda? No, come on in and gave you a bed and so on. Total strangers. That was not unusual. That was Southwest Africa, Transvaal, Free State, anywhere you could have done that. There was, that was the kind of attitude. You can't recognize South Africa today from what, what it was. And that's why these people who wanted me to feel bad about the old South Africa thing, we had problems. But it was like heaven compared to now. Yeah, n- none of us at the time thought South Africa in the 80s was trouble-free. But I must say, looking back now, it's almost like it was trouble-free in comparison. Tersha, what would you say? I mean, it's just, we didn't appreciate what we had at the time. I think we took it for granted. We thought this is normal. But coming from Rhodesia, I realized it wasn't normal because, well, Rhodesia had a lot of good things. We weren't that Christian. Wow. I mean, South Africa was just, 
this is the most Christian country on the planet, I, I thought. And having traveled around a lot since, I, I think we were. We were far more Christian than any other country at, at that time in the 70s and 80s. Which is, oh, there's an excellent article I saw in 1994 from the, British, from the London, what was the London Times, editorial. And the title was, The Real Enemy is Calvinism. And the editor of the London Times was writing, you must uh, understand what poor Nelson Mandela's got to deal with. His real problem in South Africa is not apartheid. The real problem is Calvinism. The war in South Africa is a war against Calvinism. And that's the biggest enemy that Mandela's got in creating a new South Africa. Wow. Sorry, Alpha. Yes, I have a question about what do you think, like, we know history, and a lot of communists actually know history, like, I'm, I'm talking about mm. the heads of, of communism. They know what happened to communism. They know that it's set for failure. Why do you think they still do it? I mean, I understand that they want to get things. They want to still, they want to be rich right now. But they know that it's set for failure. Why do you think they still... Okay, so, there's a religious fervor. If we could have the faith that many communists have, they've got some brilliant faith. I mean, they believe everything came from nothing. And uh, the, so, if you ask the average communist, they would say, yes, well, you know, but communism wasn't properly enforced. It wasn't done right. Uh, we can do it better next time. And uh, so many of them will be, uh, they won't acknowledge it's a total failure because they'll all say, well, you know, okay, there was a lot of problems under Stalin, but it was a lot better than under the Tsar, which isn't even vaguely true. And the Tsar had something like 62 executions a year in all of the Russias for every reason, murder, kidnapping, and so on. Lenin had hundreds of thousands executed every year. Stalin had millions executed every year. The Tsar had something like a thousand, couple of thousand secret police. Lenin had hundreds of thousands. Stalin had over a million. <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, for them to say, but, but the commissars are better than the Tsars, I think they've got this revolutionary fervor. They believe blindly in communism and also believe, well, we'll do it better or different next time. I think that's the main excuse. Yes. Well, you see, you see, what's really important to understand communism motivation is because they don't believe in heaven, hell, God. I, you remember the Imagine song of uh, John Lennon? Some are saying that the, uh, BLM and Antifa are saying this should be America's new national anthem. Now, if I'm not mistaken, it's got Imagine, no heaven above, no hell beneath. The only thing that exists is us now. Now, if there's no heaven, if there's no hell, there's no right or wrong eternally, there's no God, there's no Ten Commands, so on. we've got to make our best life now. We've got to create heaven on earth. How are we going to do this? Well, they convinced the way is through class struggle, economic determinism, materialism, and so on. So because they don't believe in the spiritual, the eternal, they don't believe in God, they don't believe in the Bible, they don't believe in Ten Commands. So they, they, in their world, they believe what they're doing is for the, for the good, for the best. That's, it makes sense if you're not a Christian, but you've got to be an atheist and you've got to be an evolutionist and you've got to believe in social Darwinism for it to make any sense to you. But, you know, when, when you get to understand the communist mind, they'll think... Why are you so sentimental about, you know, a few million corpses? Like, so what? Uh, it's, it's, they're going to die sometime anyway. What difference does it make if they die a bit earlier? Uh, I mean, everyone dies. And this is for the greater good. It's for a good cause. You know, why are you so sentimental? You can't make an omelette without breaking eggs and so on. And this is the kind of, uh, I mean, they justify. Uh, do you know uh, Lenin, sorry, Trotsky, Trotsky, the hero of the revolution, snowball in uh, animal farm. Uh, even after he was evicted from the party, sent into exile and fled just a few weeks before he got murdered by Stalin's NKVD, he said, I still believe that the party is always right. And I still believe uh, that communism will triumph. And I still believe uh, that that uh, the, the party will always do what's right. And we've got a trust party. Now, he's in exile because of the party. He's been exiled. But he still believed in Marxism. 
apparently until the day they put an ice axe through his head. And there are a lot of, if you listen to the show, show trials or read the transcripts of the show trials from the 1930s, when the greatest leaders of the revolution, Berea, uh, Yagoda, they, these were heads of, of, of the NKVD and they've been tried for treason and they, their last words are, long live the Soviet revolution, long live the Communist Party, long live Comrade Stalin. And he's betrayed them. They're about to get shot. Blind belief. Unreal. Fidel Castro's best friend, who he had put against the war and shot for losing the war against the South Africans in Angola, um, uh, General Sanjay, or Marshal Sanjay, um, he also says, yeah, long live the Cuban Revolution, the Communist Party of Cuba, uh, Comrade Castro. And, uh, you know, if Christians could have that kind of die undying faith in... in in God, as these communists have in communism, it's extraordinary. It's really fire in the minds of men. I've spoken to a lot of communists. I think, like, I've got to know them somewhat. Why do you think history always repeats itself? Because human nature is so similar. Uh, we can learn from history or we can let human nature lead in this way. So, you know, inevitably, what do you get? You get hard times make strong people. Strong people make good times. Good times make soft people. Soft people make bad times. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's this almost generation. Now, you do get exceptions. You do get revivals and so on. But, but generally speaking, uh, if things go too well for us, we become soft and selfish. So hard times are not necessarily that bad. I, I'm constantly thinking adversity is not our enemy. Apathy is our enemy. Bad times are good for spiritual work. Basically, teach their children to, keep, to stay hard so that they yes. can keep the good time. Well, for example, at least with my generation, we all were conscripted off to the army, and the army gave us some hard times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, kicked out of bed at five in the morning, um, run at the double, this and the other, and, and you know, um, iron your bed, perfect square, we decide to sleep on the floor, <laughs> too much trouble to make your bed like this every day. And uh, so, so it was that, that although we were living in good times, we... we uh, we were forced to do uh, harder things. That's why I think schools having... We used to have cadets at school. We were taught to drill and march and shoot and so on. And we were sent to bush training in Rhodesia where we'd go into the bush and game range would teach us how to survive in the bush and how to track and anti-track and survive and find water and so on. And I, I think that's the thing of having s tough PT, tough... Uh, and duties. Now, if you're brought up in a farm, you've already got duties on the farm which force a person not to be too soft... Um, but unfortunately in the city things are too easy generally and people in the city can become real couch potatoes if they're not careful <laughs> don't want to become a couch potato on Wednesday yesterday we had Nick our CLB manager uh, giving a story about long distance running he was an asthmatic and he uh, struggled to even breathe and he determined to become a runner and he's still running and he calculated his run what was 48,000 kilometers so far on his own feet? But he was talking about, you know, the amount of people who'd give up. Uh, but, uh, you know, to persevere, and he had struggled to run his first kilometer, but, you know, perseverance, and now he runs to work often, and depends on the weather. But uh, he's run the Comrades Marathon five times, two oceans and so on. That's an asthmatic who could have had a doctor's note excusing him from PT at school. So sometimes it's a choice. You can take the lift. You can choose to take the stairs. Mm -hmm. But then in, in the world today where the schools are not doing anything about it, what can parents do? In the schools? Well, yes. You know, you think how easy it was for my parents. For my parents, uh, the school taught us discipline. Yeah. The government conscripted us and we got uh, um, uh, military service and all this. But... Uh, Today, there's no discipline in the schools, there's no discipline in the average church, there's um, next to no discipline in the society. If the parent doesn't teach discipline, they're probably not going to get it, unless the grace of God breaks in and this child gets regenerated and uh, the Holy Spirit galvanizes them into a self-denying lifestyle. Uh, it's not going to happen otherwise. You know, I, I came from a 
comfortable family background and then I get converted and I turn my back on two university scholarships, Stellenbosch and UCT, and I go and become a faith missionary and hospital Christian fellowship and end up hitchhiking around South Africa and across the border. And it, so I chose a lifestyle that made things harder. And um, my parents could have made things a lot easier for me. I, I, I went deliberately. It was like... Um, my comfortable life no longer interested me. And that led me to meet the persecuted church and they changed my mind about a lot of things. So, But I've got to thank the SADF and um, Hospital Christian Fellowship for also giving me a pretty uh, good intro because Hospital Christian Fellowship was seriously strict. Uh, I'd get pulled out of bed at two in the morning because my desk was untidy or something like that. And... Uh, <laughs> I, we'd have all night prayer meetings and things like this, just call it drop the hat. And, but not prayer change, prayer meetings where you, you all stay awake through the night and you know, things like that. And then expect to have a normal day the next day. So HF was also a mission that made things a bit harder than the average one would. Good mission. But made up of nurses. Nurses are really very disciplined, or at least the nurses they're in those days were. <laughs> they were. <laughs> a lot of them now are not quite... <clears throat> She was not, she was basically not dying. Ah, yeah. oh, shame. No, really That's a disgrace. Florence Nightingale should be the gold standard for nursing. Mm -hmm. It's a disgrace to people called a nurse who, who don't care about their patients. Other comments, observations? I saw a picture of uh, the statue of Lenin being pulled down in Ethiopia. Yes. And I'm sure there were statues of Lenin in other places except Russia as well. But why? Well, the Russians took over Ethiopia. It's intriguing thing that the Russians had set up uh, in Somalia a client state but then when they managed in 1974 to get Ethiopia they moved in with the revolution that overthrew um, Emperor Haile Selassie and murdered Haile Selassie and his family and all the rest which was hideous uh, and uh, then the Russians then mobilized the Ethiopian army to destroy the army they just trained and set up and armed in Somalia which just showed the, the, the fickleness of the Russians. We often think of the Americans being fickle of, you know, turning against their allies, but the Russians could do it just as quickly. And there they went just like that, pro-Somalia against Ethiopia to pro-Ethiopia against Somalia, just because the government had changed and it, it suited their purposes. And um, uh, that's why they had those big Lenin statues in Ethiopia. Ethiopia was a communist satellite. Tens of thousands of Cuban troops Hundreds of Soviet advisors, I think thousands of Soviet advisors actually, in Ethiopia under Colonel Mengistu. They killed millions of people there, overwhelmingly Christians in, in Ethiopia under the persecution. So, yes, they had statues of Lenin, Ethiopia. I'm not sure if they had any statues of Lenin in Mozambique. I didn't see any personally, but. Uh, oh, talking about statues, on the 30th of June, which is the independence of, of Congo, of the DRC, mm -hmm. They basically broke off all the statues of Leopold, of the King Leopold oh. in Belgium and in Congo. Oh, yeah, it was like even massive, in Belgium. Yes, it was a massive celebration, and videos were taken, and they took some of those statues huh. in, in the museum. They said they're not; they shouldn't be in public places anymore. Thirtieth of Congo, because he apparently mistreated a lot of people in Congo. And yet, in his lifetime, King Leopold was acclaimed the greatest humanitarian in history because how he had saved an entire nation from cannibalism, savagery, slavery, and he created the Congo Free State out of his own personal fortune. He had bankrupted himself. He had put all of his personal wealth in because the government of Belgium wouldn't uh, put any money into the Congo. So he personally financed the freeing of the Congo and the building of the roads and railways and everything else, which, which lifted up the people of Congo and trebled their life expectancy and so interesting that now he's a demon, but in his lifetime he was acclaimed as a great hero. It just shows how when history is rewritten, mm. yeah, you know, where is the truth? Yeah. Because uh, maybe they were exaggerating in his lifetime. They're certainly exaggerating now. But the truth is not uh, that he was totally evil and did nothing good, because the Congo people 
immeasurably benefited from the Congo Free State versus what they had before. I mean, before that was just intertribal genocide, literally intertribal cannibalism that was going on. It was the heart of darkness. Uh, it was dep depicted at that time. There's a book out called The Heart of Darkness. That it was uh, the most dangerous place on earth, the Congo, lowest life expectancy on earth and so on. And uh, to think of what was achieved in in his lifetime, and the people there were all thrilled about it, and how peaceful the Congo came. Then you look at missionaries like C.T. Studd and others and what they achieved and what was going on there. And the, the Congo, uh, there is today easily 200 times more Bible-believing born-again Christians in the Congo than there is in Belgium. The Congo is spiritually light years better than Belgium. It's intriguing, uh, but uh, I, I don't like these people rewriting history in such a way that oh, aren't we so much better than our grandparents and great grandparents' generation? You know, they were so evil. We are so good. I mean, look, we legalize abortion, blasphemy, pornography. I mean, how wonderful are we? And you've got these self righteous Pharisees. I thank you, God, I'm not like my grandparents. Um, just to clear, um, yes. do we have, um, of what we learn from what the Bible states, should be the relationship between the church and state. Um, yeah. Do we have any good examples to look at through human history? In which well, you've got some great examples of what not to do, that's for sure. Yeah, um, it's quite apparent. <laughs> um, but examples that we can, yeah. that we can learn from. Yeah. The so, the church is not meant to be over the state, such as uh, when the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages controlled governments, literally, from the top. Uh, that was bad. You don't want to have the state above the church like in the Soviet Union or in China. Uh, what you want is the church and state next to one another, minister of justice, minister of grace. Minister of justice has the sword, minister of grace has the keys to the kingdom. Now, these two should be mutually supportive. If you just take the British architecture, you've got the House of Commons with a road on the side, you've got Westminster Abbey. So the minister of justice and the minister of, of grace are next to one another, mutually supportive, we hope. You know, one prays to and for and speaks to and advises and the other protects and so on. But they shouldn't interfere with one another. They should be mutually supportive in a sense, but, but distinct and both are under God. The church is not under the state. The state is not under the church. Church and state are both under God. So when many people speak about separation of church and state, they actually mean separation of state and, and God. The American Constitution doesn't have the term separation of church and state. The Russian or Soviet Constitution did. Separation of church and state, what they really meant was uh, separation of state from God, from God's word, and law, and accountability, which was terrible. So uh, the goal should be a very decentralized state and a very decentralized church. We don't want totalitarianism in the church, epitomized by Pope. We don't want totalitarianism in the state, epitomized by dictator or emperor. We want decentralization, like Swiss model for uh, state, and we'd also like congregational self-government for the church. We don't want the church to be a hierarchy, and we don't want the state to be a hierarchy. So decentralization is better. Yes? Well, one thing I just thought about when we spoke about decentralization was um, if everyone decides for himself, then how will like the law forbid things like abortion and stuff like that? Because in Switzerland, those things are legal. And no Wasn't always. The population changed because of education and media and so on. So you can see a lot of liberalizations coming to Switzerland. Sadly, the system of government's good, but the population has become corrupt. Mm, because if, I mean, if everything gets decentralized like that, no one will come from somewhere else to tell you abortion is bad and stuff. Okay, like that. no, well, that's the job of the church. And the church in Switzerland couldn't have been doing the job if they've now legalized that. It, it, there was a time when pornography, blasphemy, and abortion was illegal in Switzerland. It's changed because the population's changed. And so the population has changed in South Africa. But the population's changed in South Africa because of the media and the education system. So now people are voting for things that they were against before and, uh, and against things that they used to be for. So uh, plainly, this is the job of, of the church in education, evangelism, discipleship. If we get what we're after, a confederation of microstates in the Cape of Good Hope, and you might have Bokop decides they're going to have Islamic Sharia law in Bokop. And Rondebosch chooses to be, hopefully, a Christian 
um, state and and para and so on. And you've got some place like maybe the city bowl of Cape Town decides to be more secular. Who knows? Or hippies. Uh, but you could have like a referendum. And most of Cape Town, I'm sure, the referendum say no abortion allowed. For sure. And you would see, hopefully, if we do better evangelism to such a different municipalities would, would come out with those laws. I don't think it would be difficult to get the vast majority of municipalities to vote against pornography, not in our suburb. Just like uh, when we had our little municipalities, Pinelands and Fishhook were dry, no alcohol allowed. I said alcohol brings in other problems. So there was no alcohol <laughs> sold in, it doesn't mean a person couldn't buy alcohol outside and bring it in, but, but they couldn't have a, a, bar, a, a bar or a bottle store in, in Pinelands or Fishhook. That's mm -hmm. the way it was. Now the uni cities upset all this. It, municipalities no longer have power over what they can do in the areas. But you make it decentralized. A lot of people might not mind it being somewhere else, but they don't want to be in their suburb. And so often you'll get rid of this, and that's how they've gotten rid of a lot of pornography in America, is the not in my suburb. And so you push it out, out, out. So, for example, a few years ago, when um, Tiller the Killer was killed, uh, and then Gosnell was arrested, there were only three abortionists in all of America that could, would do a third-term abortion, and then there was only one. This one got shot and the other one got arrested. Third term abortions, um, third trimester. So, uh, at uh, uh, some years ago, I saw eighty five percent of the counties of America had no access to abortion. And the vast majority of states had no access to abortion in America, and obviously there are places like New York and Chicago and Los Angeles where you could get an abortion. But there were whole areas where there wasn't a single doctor willing to do an abortion in the entire area. Um, in South Africa, I saw crisis things from the Abortion Rights Action Group that the vast majority of uh, provinces in South Africa, th there's no doctors willing to do abortions. And that they can go all over. There's whole hospitals, whole districts and counties where nobody is willing to do an abortion or has been trained to do an abortion. And so they've been trying to bully people to do it. And many of the uh, younger uh, med stu school students aren't interested in being taught an abortion, saying, not interested. Yes. And so uh, they're saying, you know, we're in danger of, we've made it legal, but there's no one willing to do it, which is another way of going about it. Uh, so uh, th this is, there's many ways to win a, a war. But decentralization is better. If you go for winner takes all, you might lose. But if you go for decentralization, you can win in a lot of areas.